Welcome to uh, PMI Live. Uh, today, we're talking about the importance of great stakeholder engagement, specifically to power improvement. And today, we're joined, um, I'm joined with Rich Seddon and a panel of expert practitioners. So I'm Susanna Clark. I'm going to be facilitating our session today. For those of you who've joined us previously, you'll know that what we look for in PMI Live is to create a really great live and interactive experience for everybody. Um, so we've got our guests and they will obviously be uh, live, but we're also going to be using our poll feature. We're going to be using the chat, the Q&A functionality. Um, so we're really looking for you to get involved. We will be having a roundtable discussion. And when we are, please, if you put your any questions that you want to ask any of our guests, put those into the chat and I will facilitate asking those questions at the right time. So a big hello to everybody who is also joining us via our live streams on LinkedIn, on Facebook and on YouTube. We'd um, love for you to take advantage of the features I've just been talking about. So to be able to chat, to pose questions to our panel, you can actually register right at this minute. So if you go to pmi.co.uk forward slash webinars, you can come on in and join us. Um, and it would be great to see you all here. So we're delighted, as I said, to have a panel of guests with us joining us today. And I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves. Michelle, I'm going to start with you. If you could do your, your introductions, that would be great. Great. Yeah, thank, thank you, Susan. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone. It's an honor to be with you today. I'm one of those uh, blessed people that learned early on in life what I wanted to do. And of all things that started even before I uh, went to, before I finished college and a uh, general management class, I heard about a management philosophy by a gentleman named Dr. W. Edwards Deming. Dr. Deming's philosophy resonated with me as a person, values that I have. And then when I was getting my master's in statistics, I had a professor, Dr. Gypsy Rainey, who worked with Dr. Deming, and she showed how the things that I love could come together in a career around continuous improvement. And I've done that my the, the rest of the time. I did it as a consultant in a lot of different industries and in nonprofits, and most recently at the U.S. Department of Defense. I uh, became a master black belt at one of the first companies that implemented Lean Six Sigma, a company called Allied Signal that was an automotive company, the later became part of Honeywell. I took that into technology at Compact Computer Corporation and Hewlett Packard, and most recently in supply chain management at a company called Mearslon, which is the largest container shipping company in the world and uh, then with Hellman Worldwide Logistics. So it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to the discussion and your questions. And Michelle, we're welcoming people today from all around the world. Do you want to just tell us where you are based today? Yes. So I'm in a little town called Lake Wiley in South Carolina in the U.S. Uh, so you'll recognize that my accent is a little differently. So if you have any difficulties understanding me, I'll completely understand. Just ask again and I will repeat. Uh, I won't talk any slower, but I will. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Um, Alan, I know you've just hot-footed it across um, to join us, and I'm really glad to see you here. Um, welcome. I wondered if you, you could also introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you. Great to be here, um, and welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Alan Fairbairn. Um, I'm currently the Director of um, Delivery and Business Excellence for Helios Towers. Um, my career started around 20 years ago. Um, I spent a couple of years in the oil and gas industry, and then I moved into the power sector and I moved to the Middle East and I spent around 15 years with Agreco, working through various engineering operations, supply chain, um, and my, my last role was an MD for Agreco in Western Central Africa. Um, I've predominantly worked in Africa and the Middle East throughout my career, and I've been really fortunate to be in situations where um, business excellence and continuous improvement has really enabled business growth to happen and I've come up against some significant opportunities and challenges during that period. 
um, and I left the Greco last year and joined Helios Towers, um, who are Africa and Middle East's foremost sort of tower company, um, providing tower infrastructure to mobile network operators. And joining Helios, I'm pleased to say they've got a fantastic continuous excellence program, which, which I'm proud to be part of. And I look forward to sharing some of the experiences that I've uh, developed um, experience over the last 20 years on the call today. So thank you, Susanna, for inviting me. Pleasure. And where in the world are you for our audience? I'm currently in Nairobi. Um, for anyone that knows Nairobi, the Wi-Fi in the, the hotel I was in was really poor. So I hot-tailed it across Nairobi in the last hour. <laughs> the gumbo rally, but I'm pleased to say I'm at my friend's house with decent Wi-Fi. So. And, and may I just add, Alan, I have never seen anyone look more composed in those circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Rich, over to you. Cool, thanks. Um, so I'm sure many of you uh, know me from uh, from these sessions that uh, that we run every month. Um, so my name is Rich Seddon. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm one of the managing partners at PMI. Um, I led our management buyout uh, back in 2009 from our uh, founders and have been running the company uh, along with my fellow partners uh, since then. Um, my primary responsibilities are um, client management and also run our commercial operations. Um, so in terms of client sectors that I work in and have worked across throughout my career, having uh, consulted and led um, client interventions, um, we're talking rail, IT, construction, um, for consulting clients as well, charity sector, membership organizations, chemicals and uh, defense as well. Um, so fairly broad sector that I cover in different environments there, um, from manufacturing through to, um, through to service provision uh, and everything in between. Um, and um, one, I'll, I'll explain shortly, uh, I'll be leading the initial part of the session, I'll explain shortly why this topic has come up. Um, but within that, my, my specialty is, uh, is leading client interventions, as I mentioned. So particularly um, my lens today is uh, zooming out and seeing and sharing with you my observations from advising clients who are running major change programs and change projects um, to help them, uh, and I'll be sharing my observations in the in the behaviours and in the and, and in the uh, processes that I see and the activities that work and indeed that don't work. Super, thanks, Rich. Barry, last uh, but by no means uh, least, uh, obviously. Thank, thank you, Susie. Too kind. Um, so <laughs> I I just like to add my welcome to to uh, Alan, Michelle, and Rich, of course. Uh, and there is an international aspect to this in that um, whilst not as exotic as South Carolina and Nairobi, I'm based in Liverpool, but I'm actually Irish. So I suppose add that into the cultural mix, I think. Should be <laughs> so, so, so perhaps not as much as Rich, but I have appeared on the webinars over the course of the last 18 months, two years or so during COVID and, and subsequently um, on various topics. Um, I'm a director consultant. My name is Barry Byrne. Uh, and I've had 13 very happy years with PMI. A little bit of my career background, um, I was originally, uh, the predominant element of my first 13, 14 years in business was actually in the maritime industry. Um, and uh, of course, Michelle and I have something in common in terms of Michelle was working with Maersk Line whilst I was perhaps operating on the ships or in and around the ships. So it's some sort of synergy there. So typically a maritime background, electronics and communications, essentially. Um, and then I moved into newspaper publishing. So that would be from editorial all the way through to delivery of the newspaper. And that was that was that was a coincident with the introduction of, of color news technology. So I've been very fortunate, actually, that my time in, in industry coincided with some significant changes. And of course, the newspaper industry also had the hallmarks of significant industrial unrest and therefore stakeholder management was critical in order for us to move forward. So I worked with some of the big names and predominantly with Sky Corporation and Mirror Group newspapers. So at an international level, um, I then moved to Unilever, where I was head of continuous improvement for Europe. And I had a three year program there, uh, which in itself was really the hallmarks of really powerful systemic thinking with, of which stakeholders were significant contributors to that. And we had this concept of the integrated supply chain. So I'm talking early 90s now, mid 90s. My last uh, 12 years in industry was with uh, Airbus, Airbus uh, Aerospace in Broughton. 
And I suppose that's probably significant for the conversation we have today in that I was leading an, an area wide program, which was defining and deploying the 10 year strategy for that business. But in addition to defining and applying the strategy, I was also accountable for the investments that underpin that. And just to add grist to the mill, I also had the resource that were delivering that change as well. So clearly lots of opportunity, as you can imagine, to engage and work with stakeholders, mostly successful, but not all. <laughs> um, so I think it's probably fair to say great learning, some really good insights into this topic. Um, I think it's very important and uh, very topical that we're looking at this today, Rich, as in my practice. And as, as, as Rich was describing earlier on, you know, we typically consult to a very broad range of clients across all sectors and at all levels. I am not sector specific in that way. So I see stakeholder engagement, influence and management of stakeholders to be critical. So great to be talking about this today. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, what a very well qualified group you are. It's lovely to have you all <laughs> with us today. So, Rich, can I hand over to you to take us through what we're going to cover today, please? You certainly can. Um, so let me give you some background. And we've started to touch on it. I think uh, all of us have started to uh, um, give the impression as to why we think this topic is important. But why have we selected this? Now, as regular attendees of these sessions will know, um, we uh, issue voice of the customer surveys at the end of every one of these sessions to you guys, to the many, many thousands over the past two years, um, two years or more um, that have joined them. Now, in that voice of the customer survey, one of the questions we ask is what topics would you like to see us cover in future PMI Live events? We have had um, and I'm quoting here from uh, checked it up to date the first thing this morning, um, a raft on the subject of stakeholders. So topics, and I'm, I've abbreviated here, um, things like how to identify stakeholders, how to engage with stakeholders, how to involve stakeholders in change programs, why are stakeholders important to my change programs? Um, dealing with difficult stakeholders, Michelle, that's one for you. Um, <laughs> com com communicating with stakeholders. Um, what slash who are stakeholders in the improvement projects? So we've got a key, the a key uh, recurring topic there of stakeholders and different angles. So what we've aimed to do today is replicate that in the uh, panel discussion we'll have, which um, we will be stepping through four different themes to look at the same topic from four different angles. Um, that's the objective today. And then the second thing is voice of the customer, voice of the process. Now I touched on it earlier on in terms of our experience. Now working with the range of clients we do, um, we uh, both formally and informally start picking up um, on key topics and key themes and key challenges that they're facing. Um, now, um, as, and anyone that's familiar with uh, the uh, GIB model that we teach um, in, uh, in many of our programs, um, talking about, um, in fact, I've got my next slide, in fact, why am I going to describe a picture to you and I can show it to you? Uh, there we go. Um, so anyone that's familiar with this model, um, this stuff down the bottom, the social, socio-emotional and political realities, that's where the real nuts and bolts are. And that's where we see um, stakeholder engagement, stakeholder management, really quite firmly sitting, yet there are tasks that relate to the other in, in, uh, the, at the top of the uh, hamburger model and the Gibb model, uh, going from your current position to desired outcome. So that's one of the reasons why we see this, but we hear it and we know from our, our own work with clients and taking that pan, that pan client view, that programs that have successfully engaged their stakeholders are in themselves more efficient and more effective. So those two aspects are coming together, both the voice of the customer and the voice of the process. And we hope to be sharing some of that with you today. So before we progress any further, let's just uh, get some brackets around this thing. What do we mean by a stakeholder? Now, I've just put some examples down here. This is not an exclusive list. I repeat, not an exclusive list. Um, there are many, many more you can add on both sides of this. Um, but just to give you an idea uh, and hopefully put some brackets around the kind of topics that we're talking, under the external stakeholder, uh, grouping, we'd, think, we'd have things like government, regulators, banks, finance providers, shareholders potentially, although you could take the view that that's internal rather than external, doesn't matter. It's uh, mainly just a point of uh, getting them up here. Uh, things like trade unions, as Barry mentioned, uh, you know, communities in which you operate and your businesses operate. Um, and increasingly, 
uh, part of the external stakeholders grouping is the natural environment itself as a stakeholder mm -hmm. and becoming increasingly conscious on the impact on the environment um, that we have and obviously all the bodies that operate within there and you could include suppliers and customers now from the right hand side some examples of internal stakeholders uh, managers board execs other teams departments internal customers uh, compliance teams perhaps auditors uh, uh, other business units sister businesses etc etc it depends on your context uh, and the setting that you're operating in but i just thought it would be useful to uh, put some examples up so we're clear um, as to what we're talking about uh, today so on that note and in that context we would like to uh, start by uh, asking you guys a poll and the question we're asking is this to what extent are the following share, uh, stakeholders effectively engaged in enabling improvement in your organization? Now we've deliberately shrunk this down rather than go through the entire list. Um, so don't get too hung up on the groupings. The three first ones, so what we're talking about in the wider uh, business slash organization is people that aren't necessarily directly involved in the change. So the, 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 the general organization, um, those that might be affected or may not be affected, what are, how are they engaged uh, effectively in, in uh, stakeholder management? Um, operational managers, the people responsible for the operation of the business, senior leaders, I think it's self-explanatory. Then external stakeholders can include any of those that I just uh, mentioned, and you may have others. I can see that that has just popped up on the screen. Um, anyone that is joining us on the live streams, uh, you can also pop your messages, uh, your responses into the um, into the comments field, um, but I can see that's working and people are responding. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Yes, yeah, so you should be able to see that on your screen. As Rich said, it's a ranking poll um, focusing I on... I don't think Rich did say that, actually, so good point. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> let, me, let me clarify. This is a ranking poll. Um, so... <laughs> So you have the chance to um, consider the question to what extent, and then the, we've gone for three options, obviously, as you can see, not at all, to some extent, or they are very um, effectively engaged. So I'm just going to... Intriguingly, I can see uh, that the maths isn't adding up here. So... Um, in order to use ranking polls you do need the latest version of zoom and it looks like uh, this month um our audience have not got the latest uh, version so uh, some of you are responding i can see that um but if you would like to if you can't see the poll just pop it in the chat and we can see that uh, yes as well any responses that's very interesting we've uh, been using these ranking polls in uh, since january uh, and They've had quite good uptake. That's mm. intriguing. Something going on today. Um, OK, I'm going to just give you another couple of seconds and then I'll end the poll and share and see what we can see. Right. Just... So my understanding of this, Rich, do correct me if I'm wrong. Should I just handle it in the first place then? Yeah, why don't you do that? <laughs> Absolutely. That's one of those opportunities. To, let's hand over. <laughs> okay, that's, that's some stakeholder management there for you live, folks. Um, <laughs> so um, in, in response to question one, um, we have got uh, almost all uh, the most popular response saying some of the time. So mm. in terms of engaging the wider business organization, 61% uh, of uh, those of you that were able to respond uh, have said that some of the time. Um, very engaged, just down at 13%. Uh, and not at all at 26%. Um, operational managers, we've got 9% uh, not at all, 52% um, some, and very 39%, it's interesting. Uh, senior leaders, now that is the surprise for me looking at this. Um, so on senior leaders, uh, mm. how effectively are they engaged? Uh, some of the time 61% and very 39%, uh, not at all at a zero, which is really interesting. Uh, and then externals, we've got uh, on external stakeholders, 26% uh, on not at all, 65% uh, on some and 9% on very. Um, the senior leaders is the standout for me there. Um, 
I shouldn't be surprised, but I am a little because it doesn't necessarily reflect um, my experience. I don't know about you guys. Um, uh, Michelle, is that typically what you would expect to see? And I know this is the topic you're going to be, uh, uh, we're going to be touching on later on. Yeah, I was surprised by it as, as well, Rich. Um, but it may say something about the audience that we have as well. So maybe they've done a good job of engaging those, st those stakeholders. But... Cool. I think, Rich, what's, in, what's interesting is the definition, as we say, it's effectively engaged. So engaged and effectively <laughs> engaged, because we do know external stakeholders may, may engage themselves, whether you like it or not. <laughs> so so the, the question is, is, is what, what are we trying to accomplish, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, indeed, yeah, indeed. Yeah. And, and the reason we uh, position these polls is just to get mm. a sense um, of, uh, of who's in the room and, um, sure. and what your world is looking like. So mm. um, worth me pointing out uh, at, this, at this juncture that um, as, as we go through these exclamations, the more live and interactive we can keep this, um, let us know if we've missed something here. Let us know if you'd like to add some explanation to uh, a nuance there that we've potentially missed or an explanation or tell us how it is in your world, in your organization. It'd be great to hear. Just pop it in the chat or the Q&A. Um, Suze is monitoring those as we speak. Okay, so um, my screen, if you could just take those off the screen, Suze, that'd be great. I have. Great. Um, and let's take us take you through the panel discussion and how we're going to structure this then. So we've got four themes and these are they. They're on screen at the moment. Um, once we've taken them off screen, Suze will add each individual one to the chat um, as we're going through. So um, you can either take a screenshot of this now, if you like, uh, for reference. Um, and prepare your questions, comments, and observations. We'd really like to hear from you of each of these. So as I mentioned earlier on, we're looking at the same topic, stakeholders, effective stakeholder engagement uh, from four different angles here. So the first one uh, I've rather elaborately titled the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and the question we're going to be posing to the panel there is, in your experience, what difference can effective stakeholder engagement make? Number two, and we know, uh, from, again, from Voice of the Customer, that the more practical we can get with these things, the better. Um, how to engage different audiences. So Sue's going to put to all four of us um, these topics here. Um, how about the wider business organisation? How can you engage them, operational managers, senior leaders, and external stakeholders? And then we're going to move on to topic uh, theme three, um, which is focusing some of the differences between being a stakeholder and a practitioner. Now, all four of us on the panel today have all been uh, change agents and leaders of change. And what we're going to see is just explore, is there, should there be a difference? And what have we seen in our practice as we've moved from uh, being actively involved in the doing of the change programs to leading change programs? And how do those two, um, how do those two differ, if at all? And then finally, we're going to finish off with... Um, Again, this comes from Voice of the Customer, um, how to seek stakeholder engagement when it's lacking. Mm. So this is where we're going to seek to explore um, any advice, experience and insight as to how to identify and fill the gaps in engagement where you identify they exist. Now, as I say, um, you can either screenshot this uh, slide now so you've got it for reference. But as we step through each one, Suze will pop them into the chat and the text into the chat. So once we take this uh, slide off the screen, uh, you can see what it is, uh, the, what it, the topic is that we're covering at the time. And just ahead of uh, starting with the first question, which I have put in the chat for everyone, uh, we've had a, a comment in, interestingly, Barry, uh, who uh, from Sean, who's saying, I have to concur with Barry, maybe answered the question in haste. If I were to do it again and focus on the word effective, <laughs> then responses would well, be different. Sean especially with senior managers. Okay. So thank you very much, Sean. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so um, what I'd like to do is take that question. So again, in your experience, what difference can effective stakeholder engagement make? And Michelle, can I start with you? Sure, and, and it's funny that you mentioned that because I, I actually want to think that it is important for me to de define, you know, what, what, when I think of effective, what, is, what does that include? things like identifying who the stakeholders are, mm. you know, where are they today and where do you need them to be? Who do they influence and who influences them? And perhaps even more importantly is what is important to them? What is the, 
the benefit or value that they can derive and what are their challenges and key concerns. So that means that as practitioners, we have to be close enough to those stakeholders to really understand what is important to them. And by doing that, you bec- I think in what you're doing, you become more and more and more holistic and, and looking at what is good for the common good of the organization, not just yourself. So to me, that, that is effective stakeholder management is that you are learning more about your stakeholders and looking more about how you can get to that common good. Mm. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Thanks Alan, for you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, no, I've reflected on this question actually since you know we've we've done some pre-work on this. I think this is it sort of evolved for me over time. Um, I, I was in the same company for 15 years and went from being a practitioner to sort of being a stakeholder sort of later on. But it's really about for me, it's about creating sort of win-win synergies. In business, I think often when we're trying to implement change or lead change, um, whether as a practitioner or a stakeholder, I think often we can lose sight of the fact that everyone in the organisation has good intentions mm. Mm. most of the right. time. And, and I think it's really about trying to sometimes put yourself in the position um, of, of other people and really um, try to focus on creating win-win synergies. And I think that has been a lesson that I learned quite early in, in my business continuous improvement career. And it's really helped me evolve um, and, and really focus the mind, as it were, on, on engaging stakeholders um, in the right way and achieving the results that, that for the common goal of the organisation. Mm. Thank you. Rich? So I... Absolutely agree uh, with the areas that uh, Michelle and Alan have both touched on. Um, and uh, I, so, so without duplicating, I think the some of the benefits and some of the differences I've seen um, where stakeholder management is done effectively are actually some of the unexpected things. Um, so where, um, and particularly my, the topic I'm going to address in the next theme is the wider business. So I'm kind of framing it around that. Mm. Um, I've seen where there is good uh, communication um, platform supporting uh, an improvement program uh, and and, uh, an effective strategy for communicating uh, what the project and program is, um, who's involved, which parts of the business it's likely to impact. Um, I've seen some surprising things there in a couple of occasions of opportunities for improvement being identified completely separate to the project that the project leaders never intended to see due to the awareness being raised amongst the leaders and the wider business organization. Now, sometimes that is welcome. And I think from a change leader point of view and a project leader point of view, we always need to try and keep our minds open um, whilst being alert to scope creep at the same time. And it's something that we all fear, uh, when are we ever going to get this thing over the line and finished? Mm. Um, But um, yeah, a couple of occasions, those were absolute gems in programs that I've worked with. And that came from the right people being engaged, therefore supported with the right communication uh, plan so that there was an awareness. And although people weren't actively involved in the projects, they identified opportunities when they understood what was going on and realized that the benefit that um, the project team had missed altogether because it wasn't in their remit. Um, So really interesting kind of unintended consequence, I guess. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And and Barry, your thoughts on this? So so let me try and build on some of that rather than repeating anything, because I absolutely do agree with my three colleagues here. And it comes back to the original poll, really, in the sense that what we need to do is remind ourselves of what we're trying to accomplish here. What we're looking for is robust, beneficial and permanent change, not just uh, quick fixes, not just short term stuff. And in order to do that, we need we need a process, not just to engage these stakeholders, but also to influence them. And I think, um, Michelle, that's that was some of the key points I, I was hearing from you is about this influence. Mm-hmm. Now, as I was looking at your list, Rich, it reminded me over the years, my career, really, in the early days of my career, we had the owner, the employees, trade unions and the customer. And they were easily well within line of sight for us. 
and, and consequently the, the 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 challenge of engaging and influencing working with them was a lot easier because numerically <laughs> there was a lot less of them but today you know that list is it, it's intensive and it's complex and that complexity brings contention you know sharing is contention different ones different needs and the reality today is they're often contradictory. They're not, they're not mutually inclusive. They can be exclusive. So we know that our projects can be constrained by the level of engagement by the various people that you've described. And, you know, let's not make any mistakes here. You know, our boss, owners, investors, the informal coffee machine organization that I see can have a major impact either to make or break what you're doing. So the first thing is, yeah, absolutely. It isn't easy, though, and I don't think we should pull punches on that. And, uh, you know, our approach needs to be consistent because my experience is that in order to maintain effective stakeholder engagement, we need to recognize that that engagement varies over time. It mm. waxes and wanes. It rises and falls. And I'm not just talking about the, the wider stakeholders. I'm also talking about the practitioner. Because I know in my experience, I lost my will to live sometimes. I, I lost it, you know? And I think it's important that we consider that this is not static. Um, it's dynamic. And consequently, the need for a sustained engagement program uh, is, the, is the difference between getting that robust uh, permanent change or not. That's my view. Thank you. And we've had some input in the chat, which is... Um, uh, from my experience, internal stakeholders normally fall to the same group of people, sort of general manager, heads of department, and there needs to be some good discussion and debate around selecting the right stakeholders. In, wow. in their Some, view. So, someone's seen my script here. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, in which case, it's a good time for us to segue on to our next question. So our next question is around how, um, and it's how to engage different audiences. And Rich, I'm going to start with you um, to talk about the wider um, business and organisation, please. Okay. Um, so uh, Michelle, in, in her opening comments earlier on, talked about defining who the stakeholders are. So let, let me start with that. Um, so it, how to engage the different audiences, the first step is to define them. And there's a multitude of tools there, but there's two points I wanna make um, when doing so. And once you have defined your stakeholders, number one, don't make assumptions about them. Seek to validate Absolutely. those assumptions where you have got them and turn them into theories rather than assumptions. Mm. And number two, don't ignore the stakeholders. So we've all got experience of the difficult stakeholder um, at various times. Um, and in a busy change program, it can be really tempting to um, just carry on regardless and uh, kind of run on the power of hope that they will go away at some point. Um, and uh, sometimes that is true. However, more often than not, and certainly in my experience, um, that's not the case. So. Um, Ignore, so in, in my context, my, my question here around uh, the wider business, um, don't ignore the wider business. They, they need to be, whether you realize it or not, they will be impacted um, mm. by it. And why do I say this? Um, think about your organizations as uh, you know, a complex, interrelated network of processes, tasks, people, assets, et cetera, et cetera. And within those um, yeah, interrelated areas, there's a multitude of interactions and interfaces. And no matter how well you think you know your business or your process i can guarantee you this you won't know it all and you have no way of knowing all the different areas so when you think about how to engage the wider business it's that purpose that you're trying to tap into other people's expertise where they can be of benefit and help to optimize the uh, the, you know, the the organization and optimize your project or your your program um, within there and i think i think that's the that's the key point i'd like to make and then the um in terms of uh, engaging with them on a, on a larger scale, um, view it from a seeking advice and expertise point of view. Um, I, I mentioned earlier on, don't make assumptions. So do seek to validate those assumptions, turn them into theories and ask the questions, you know, who do we think needs to know and what might they need to know within this program? Throw it out to uh, you know, co co um, colleagues. Barry and I had a chat this morning about informal and formal um, mm. st st stakeholders, yes. stakeholder management. The whole, a whole raft of it goes on in the informal as well. Don't mm. underestimate the power of that. And there is nothing wrong with it. It doesn't necessarily need a, 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 a documented uh, you know, uh, 
um, communication plan against that piece. Um, and, uh, and then finally, getting um, super practical. Um, and in fact, I might bring this point in later on, but let me, let me just mention it now. Um, around super practical levels of how to engage with the wider business, my main advice that I'm certainly advising all my clients now is stop relying on emails to communicate about your projects. Um, no one on this planet needs any more emails <laughs> in their lives. I, I, will, I will stake some money on that. So there is a raft of um, other communication tools and lots of companies employing things like Slack and Yammer, et cetera, et cetera. But one thing that I'm encouraging all of my clients to do at the moment when it comes to this area, use video. Um, everyone, as you see, um, <laughs> every, everyone has cameras of uh, different types, whether it's on your mobile phone, on your computer, um, use them, use short videos, get your key points across. Um, there's loads of data and scientific evidence to support the absorption of knowledge um, is moving dramatically towards uh, video content. Um, so uh, take advantage of that and go with people's learning styles. They're more likely and keep them, if it's a wider organization, keep them to around about three minutes and find out more information here. Mm. Thank you. Um, couldn't agree more about the emails, by the way. Um, <laughs> so um, Hint taken. <laughs> uh, Michelle, can I come to you um, and really to talk about how to engage operational managers in your experience? Uh, yes, so, so um, one of the things that I find is that often this is the group that is thought of sort of last, that, that middle manager group, that they can either make or break wh whatever it is you're trying to do. Um, and so, and they're usually really, really busy. So you want to make it easy for them to do the right things. I think Alan mentioned about, you know, generally people want to support the, the these things, but you have to make it easy for them. Just there, there are some simple things that you can do, like just giving them something that may be in their daily huddles or visiting their staff meetings. Um, the other is, is trying to identify just one or two key behaviors that they can do that can help support it and, and encouraging them in that, but looking for what I've heard called the positive deviant. Look mm -hmm. for people who are doing things in the right way and share that, make heroes, raise those heroes up, and then people can see what it looks like. You can learn yourself what those positive deviants are doing. But, but again, because they are busy, follow up, follow up, follow up. And Michelle, I know in programs that you've been involved in, you've made really effective use of things like town halls, share fairs, and celebration of learning events. Absolutely. So we, um, uh, for example, to get people involved in like the, the whole Lean Six Sigma, the green belts were at lunch, we would have them to have their storyboards and people coming and having prizes for doing uh, quizzes. Um, so, so those kinds of things, getting the larger organization in what something I've called that, that I've heard called brown paper fairs, where you're asking you know, people come by, give us your ideas. What are we doing well? What are we not doing well? And what can we do differently? And engaging them in the dialogue. So, so involving them in the change makes it makes a difference. But definitely on the video, I'm so, so on, on video. <laughs> uh, so, so thank you for making that point, Rich. <laughs> Uh, thanks very much, Michelle. Alan, um, same question, but actually I wondered about your thoughts on senior leaders and how to engage with senior leaders. I also couldn't agree more on reducing emails. Um, so <laughs> I think we're all agreed on that. Yeah, I think um, regarding senior leaders, I think, you know, and we're, we're all, we're as good as our last quarter. Um, and I, I believe that to engage senior leaders, we need to, first of all, ensure that the senior leaders that we're working with have a working knowledge of structured business improvement programs or improvement, business improvement methodologies. I know a great training company, by the way, if anyone <laughs> needs one. Um, I, but I think that is really important because if, if, we, if we engage with senior leaders and then they sort of don't have formal training, I think it can be a challenge and I've experienced that myself. Mm. Then I think it's important to build targets into the overall strategy for the organization, whether that's annually or it's a five-year strategic cycle or even longer. I think building in business excellence and principles into that strategy really helps in creating targets that are sort of sim simple to understand, 
really does help engage senior lead leaders, but also will then help engage the, the wider organization. Um, I think it's also important when engaging um, senior leaders in the organization to encourage them to create an environment for change that allows people to make mistakes and also um, just allows people to, to learn on the job and it's not always going to be perfect. So I think sort of speaking to senior leaders and helping set up the program, um, that, that really does help. And the final point is really celebrating success. You know, it's often difficult, it's often easy to overlook sort of small wins that, that actually can lead to quite significant change in the organisation. So I'm a big fan of celebrating success and really, you know, enjoying improving your business and knowing that it's not always going to be straightforward. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, and, and in your first point, very pertinent actually, because Barry and I had a meeting um, uh, very recently with a customer. We we're having exactly the same challenge around yeah. how do they know and understand, how do the leaders know and understand what their role is it in this mm -hmm. in order to be successful in support? Super. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, and Barry, can I um, turn to you and ask you to talk about how to engage external stakeholders? Yeah, so this uh, hopefully this will 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 neatly dovetail with what we've heard before, and and that's really leading in from where Alan Alan is. Um, my initial thinking around this was around shareholders, investors, regulators, which typically are the ones that I see dominating within our clients today, right down into you know fledgling greenbelt, so the, at practitioner level, at that particular level, and this question brings into real sharp focus the need for the improvement organization to align with the existing business organization. And I think that's where the delta I'm, I'm, I'm seeing. Often we don't see the organizational accountabilities and the improvement accountabilities to be aligned. They're not, they're not seen as interconnected. So sponsors and champions of whatever you want to call them are really accountable, Suze, to consider the need of the various stakeholder categories because they, they need to and they should have that bigger picture, that wider context in which the practitioner is operating. So aligning and reflecting the needs of those often nebulous, difficult to see stakeholders really is a, is, is a challenge that in many cases is beyond the practitioner or the practitioner, him or herself, cannot absolutely resolve it on their own. But I see people trying to resolve those conundrums. Mm. So in, in terms, so therefore playing this around as the system working on this, and, and Alan was talking about this very well, we've, we need to identify who are all of them and this perception of where they might sit. And as Richard said, quite rightly, we could be wrong with our perception, but the need then to, having done that exercise and i see people actually generating stakeholders maps it doesn't translate into a strategy because it comes down to this absence of capability to know what am i going to do next how do i take this data on this piece of paper um finally it also comes down to the shareholders themselves being good shareholders mm. customers being good customers you know and they have to recognize the need to be reasonable you know, and remember, you know, then stakeholders and, uh, and shareholders like this, they're necessary constraints. They're not the people who are buying the tin of beans. So we need to be very careful that they don't detract from and the wants and needs of those override the need for us to nurture and grow our relationship with the consumer. And I think we're in danger of doing that. So this absolutely needs more than just a practitioner, then the practitioner has to have that supporting infrastructure in order to make this land. Thank you. Um, Alan, can I come back to you? We've got a question in the chat, which is that senior leaders in my experience are always busy um, and getting time with them is usually difficult. Um, and do you have any tips on how to secure some time, even if only a couple of minutes? Yeah, this is a great question and one that um, I think we all wrestle with. Um, so it's a very good question. I think we, we really have to think, think about this and, and sit down and, and reflect and say, you know, is it worth taking the time to really uh, think about improving our business? And in terms of engaging people that maybe don't have enough time, I think, part of the skill of, of being a practitioner um, or, or a stakeholder is your ability to engage people in, in the right way um, 
to allow them, to encourage them to think, you know, is it worth my time in giving it to you to, to discuss an initiative with all, that ultimately could change the business for the better? So it's not an easy question to answer. And there's not one size fits all. I think genuinely, I think this is one of the key learnings for, for black belts and, and green belts is, is how do you engage people in the right way so that people want to give you their time? Mm. And I, I do think, you know, we discussed emails earlier and it was, it was good fun, but I genuinely think we spend a lot of our time in business working on non-value added activities. Mm-hmm. So there is time in the day that we can allocate to, to re- stepping back. And I think so there are definitely times in the day we can do that as, as if we choose to do so. And we really can have the vision that's a bit longer term than, than just what we're in in that particular moment. So. Um, hopefully that's answered the question in some way thanks and Michelle I can see you're you've got your hand up what would you like to add to that yes so oddly enough um, one of the things that I found is asking for their help Uh, senior leaders want to will often want to help but they you know they're not going to insert themselves in a a lot of times they're not going to insert themselves but if you can Mm-hmm. And ask them to come open up a, a, a class that you're doing or to join a meeting uh, and just give them a couple of, of points. Again, make it easy for them. But I find that that, that actually it gives you that opportunity. And because they are speaking it for you, then they start internalizing it, that it's theirs as well. Mm. Okay, super. Thank you. So um, our next question is, um, uh, or topic theme is around the difference between being a practitioner and a stakeholder. And um, Michelle and Anna, I'd like to um, invite you to uh, participate in this, um, particularly because I know both of you in, in your background have, have played both roles. If I can start with you, Alan, what, what um, do you see as the, as the difference that you've really noticed in the learnings that you've um, come across? Yeah, and in my experience, and I guess there's different answers to this question, in my experience, you know, stakeholders would generally have a vision of a future state that may seem difficult to get there or may seem unachievable in some cases. And I've had um, good experiences where my, my key stakeholders and senior leaders have, have, um, have set a vision that is seemed difficult, but helped map, uh, when I was a practitioner, helped map a way to achieve that. Um, And then as a practitioner, I think it's really about how can you take strategic objectives and and break them down into, you know, simple um, set of activities that that are easy for people to understand, Mm. that can can create that path to the goals that we set. So that was sort of my opinion on this, but I, I do appreciate this is it's a good question, actually, that has different answers, potentially. <laughs> yes. and, and in your experience, Michelle, I'd be interested to hear if we, you know, what, you, what you've noticed. So uh, similar to, to Alan, I, you know, I sort of, I, when this question was posed, I had to say, so as a senior leader, what would I have told myself? Yeah. <laughs> Christopher before yeah. and, and it is about having this vision of, of, of this longer term vision and how it actually affects the organization and where you want to take the organization. So as a practitioner, I would tell myself, you know, look at how this can connect to the longer term. How can you uh, then, then make it a part of, of, of the, the bigger picture? Um, but the other is, I think for each of us, we are all at some point or another in terms of a change, we are each of those, each of those uh, stakeholders mm-hmm. and taking that and learning from it, you know, how do we feel in those and, and by thinking about how you, you, you yourself feel, you can start putting yourselves in their, their shoes as mm-hmm. you're creating change to them and, and uh, not just uh, having it done to you, if, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you both. So our fourth theme is how to seek stakeholder engagement when it's lacking. And this is about advice and experience and any insights that you might have um, to identify and and fill those gaps in engagement. Um, Barry, can I go to you first on this one, please? 
Uh, sure, and, and me being me, I would I clearly would insert this head to seek effective stakeholder engagement. <laughs> um, and of, of course, course. The, the, nat the natural response when I see that statement is obviously a negative one. It's him, it's her. They're not engaging with me. There's something wrong. And actually, my my approach is, and the overriding need is to have a process to build relationships in order to do this influencing. Because as, as, as Rich mentioned before about this informal, I, I mentioned the coffee cup, the coffee machine culture, you know, that's, an, that's a hugely powerful source of data. And of course, a lot of what we're doing, we may not recognize it, but it's generating data in order to form theories about what this relationship is like in order then to build the, the platform to influence. Now, there are some basics here, and I absolutely get that senior execs do provide us with vision for the future. The reality though is providing vision without providing the trust and, and the rapport and the relationships in order to help the practitioner work through the challenges is unfortunately what I see. And that, therefore these are the sort of things. So influence comes from trust, trust from rapport and rapport is, is as as we know Suze is from building relationships mm. now just because we have a relationship doesn't mean that I can influence you yeah. know so and therefore this is what comes down to the process and and, and you know we have this relationship cycle that's fun that's founded on PDSA in other words it's generating data about the situation um, and then sharing that knowledge in order to understand where do we sit in relation to that and therefore what's the strategy we need to build but unfortunately, our default position is often, I don't like that person. They're not engaging. There's something wrong here. It's probably not the best way to start. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Rich? Um, so my perspective on this one would be, um, just looking at the wording on this question, is focus on, uh, on the missing elements as gaps rather than problems. And it's a psychological positioning. It's just mm. one of those other lenses in them. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen... Um, project leaders and program leaders agonize over um, what they see as people resisting getting involved um, and stakeholders who they don't perceive to be engaged and actually it often boils down to um, they haven't no one's actually made an attempt to in the first place um, because they make assumptions as to either that person will be too busy or they won't be interested in this or they want it to be like that because they said mm. it once um, so on and so forth um, but it, framing it psychologically so you've got the energy and will yourself to go and engage with those people um, is important and I think try not to view them as problems until they become problems it, it just helps and I've coached many people recently on that um, specifically thinking about a supply chain environment uh, mm. and it was very interesting just to switch that lens mm. Mm. okay thank you Michelle um, it, when I reflected on this question, there was a, an incident that stuck with me and that and it goes to don't assume uh, you know, what the person is and why the person is acting it the way they are, you know, be curious. So, so that's sort of the outcome of this. And it, it was, uh, we were doing a black belt class. This was back during, and, and it, I apologize to my PMI friends. It was a different consulting company. Um, <gasps> And there were, and there was. <laughs> listen, <laughs> people don't listen. No such thing. Something, something that they were they were teaching that that as a statistician, there was a point that I didn't really agree with. So after the class, I was engaging one of the mm. instructors. Hey, I don't agree with this, and he and I are arguing the point. We were friends, so that was okay. Mm. But one of the other other instructors came over, a gentleman named Lloyd Provost, who's one of the smartest people I've ever known. And for some of you who are familiar with the three questions, what are we trying to accomplish? How do we know what changes in improvement? What changes mm -hmm. can we make result in improvement? Lloyd's one of the smartest people I know. And Lloyd, he, here's our dialogue. And, he's, and he said, and when he, I said that there was something that I disagreed, he immediately went, tell me more. Mm -hmm. And it was just this automatic thing. He mm -hmm. immediately went to curiosity. It was, if there is a difference, it's some, that means there's something for me to learn. He was so genuine. And I, I can't even remember if, I, if he believed my point or not. But the important thing is that what I do remember is that I felt respected. Yes. Yes. I will never, ever forget that. And I think that we can give that gift to others in that if they are, if they have a different perspective, be curious yeah. and, and ask to learn. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. 
Alan, anything to add? One thing, I think I am, um, one, one of my original sort of mentors um, when I started out my, my career was a guy called Stan James and we went through, we went through some focused improvement activity in a workshop environment. And it was quite a challenging environment. And, and Stan taught me to focus on, there's always people in the room that will um, not want to engage for whatever reason. And there'll be people that are, you know, will want to engage and there'll be people that are sort of in the middle. And Stan, the, the chap taught me to sort of focus on the people that are potentially detractors or really are lacking the willingness to engage and focus on those people. And if you can change those people throughout the process, it really has significant impacts on, on the wider team. So that's something I, as a practitioner, I really tried to do and it didn't always work. <laughs> but mm. um, when it did work, it, it was fantastic and had really significant results. And you, you often saw people's careers changing in front of your eyes over a period of time. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And um, just uh, Michelle, I've got a big thank you in the chat. I um, thought that was an excellent anecdote. Um, I have to say, I myself, I love that sense of curiosity. I think that's a, 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 a very worth, um, mm. useful uh, tip. So <laughs> if I may, Suze, um, to you put may. some more terror into you with the, uh, with the timing we've got going on here. But um, given what Alan and uh, Michelle have both just said, I've just reached across to my bookshelf. Um, so I'm currently reading this, which is a book called uh, The Fearless Organization by Amy, mm. Amy C. Edmondson at uh, Harvard Business School. Um, for, for the stuff that those guys have just described, this is fascinating. Not only the, the content, but the structure that uh, she's presented within there. Um, and, uh, you know, the, you know, the tell me more concept, mm. here is some practical guidance as to how to start trying that in your own organisation. Couldn't recommend it highly enough. OK, Fab, thank you. Um, so that completes the themes that we wanted uh, to cover today. But before we move um, on towards the end of the webinar, I would just like to ask you if you had one piece of advice for uh, an improvement practitioner, you know, what would it be? Michelle, can I start with you? Sure. Um, first, if, if things aren't going exactly as you would like them to do, look in the mirror. <laughs> uh, there's a book that had a profound effect on me. It's mm -hmm. funny, Rich, you were showing a book. And this book was called Deep Change, Discovering the Leader Within by Robert Quinn. Mm -hmm. And he and, and I remember getting these this sick feeling as he's describing it's really up to you. You have to take accountability, and it and it isn't easy, right? So he even describes it as building the bridge as you're crossing it. But it's so it's it's so amazing how you switch the power from others having the power to yourself having the power. And while you're doing the change in yourself, others may follow, may, others may change as well, but it won't be because you're pushing them to do it. It'll be because you're leading them to do it. And so that, that's really the thing that I would say is look at how you can make a difference in yourself. Yeah. So, Lovely, thanks. super, thank you. Rich? Um, so I'll keep this really simple. Um, avoid, and this is based on my personal experience from uh, when I was a practitioner, uh, avoid surprising your sponsor with both the good and the bad. And it's really key that it's both those things. And, to do, and because if you are avoiding doing that, that means you've got the cadence and the format of your updates with your sponsor and engaging them uh, spot on. Thank you. And could you just hold the book up, please? Because I'm going to um, put an Amazon link. I can see that question. Lovely. I'll do that now whilst Barry's talking. Thank you very much. Barry, over to you. One piece uh, of advice. I, I love that comment about the look in the mirror. And, and I would just continue to endorse that you as a practitioner are also a stakeholder. And, and you, need to, you need to protect yourself because I'm always curious about who's caring for the carer in this particular case. Mm. Um, so, 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 so do that, please. Um, just anecdotally, when I am looking at stakeholder mapping and influence, I do include my wife in this calculation for the simple reason that she also has a significant influence. It might sound silly, but for me, it's important. You might want to think about that. But finally, you have to believe that there's a compelling need for stakeholder engagement. If you don't see the value in it, you ain't going to do it. And unfortunately, it goes in the too hard box. 
don't go there. Thank Susan. you. And before I go to Alan, Michelle, there's a request um, for the name and author of the book that you referenced as well. If you could include that oh, in the chat, that would be great. Thank you very much. So Alan, to uh, final words on your advice. My piece of advice is quite simple, actually, and it's go to Gemba. So go to the actual place where the work is done um, and speak to the people, if you can, that are, that are carrying out the work. And if that's not possible, I think get people out of the office and away from the screens and the normal working environment. Try and get people together in a format that, that is compelling and can get ideas flowing. Um, and try and do it early in the morning. I'm a big fan of sort of, if you're going to go to Gemba, go early in the morning. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, Alan. And um, Mina, thank you, um, each of you. Um, I think it's been uh, great having you all with us and the um, amalgamation of your insights and experience have been really useful. Um, great questions from the people um, on the webinar today and really appreciate your input. Um, a couple of final words as, as we're going to close. Um, next month, uh, our webinar is on Friday, the 29th of July. Um, we're going to be talking about design principles um, and how these can be applied to continuous improvement. Um, for those of you who are podcast listeners, our latest Leading for Business Excellence podcast is with CEO John Derbyshire from Smart Suite. So he has um, shared with us his experience of performance excellence and all the lessons that he's learned along the way. So a great listen. Do um, have a look at that. And in our latest room for improvement, we've been joined by Will Gooding from Ovo Energy. Um, it's a great room for improvement, lots of personal energy as well, um, but particularly around identifying opportunities for improvement and delivering the best outcome for customers. As today has um, been all about uh, us listening to your voice to the customer and ensuring that we deliver topic accordingly. Naturally, you can expect that we're going to be sending you a voice to the customer survey shortly. Um, please do keep your uh, thoughts coming. Any feedback, we're always really appreciative and we uh, read with interest and suggestions topics would be great. So that brings me to the end of today's PMI Live. And so on behalf of PMI, Rich, our guest panellists today and myself, I'd like to thank you all for joining us and look forward to seeing you all again at the next PMI Live. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Michelle thank you. and Alan. Wonderful to have you with us. Thanks. Thank you. Take care.